What's up, everybody? Troy Cartwright here. Welcome back to another episode of Ten Year Town. Before we get started on this week's episode, I wanted to remind everybody to join the Ten Year Town community. You can do that at tenyeartown.com. We've got some really exciting stuff coming up soon, and the people in the community are going to be the first people to find out about it. Thanks. Today's guest, we've got the legendary Dave Cohen on the pod. Dave has played on over 50 number one records as a session keyboardist. He's co-produced songs for Morgan Wallen, Hardy, Jake Owen, and many, many more. I loved getting to chat with Dave on this episode, and I learned so much. I know you guys are going to love it too, so without further ado, here he is. Dave Cohen. <laughs> oh man, yeah, I'm 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 like on my 17th run through of Seinfeld right now. I'm on season seven. Mm. There's nine, right? Yes, it's quite good. It's it's good every time. It's good right up until the end because that was by design, and yeah. they did it until they didn't want to do it anymore. They couldn't do it anymore. That's my favorite. Um, well, they so, like are we, left on top, like yes. they were top of the ratings and Jerry was like, I'm done. Yeah. Before it, you know, cause have they, you, I believe they could have done. Just pull that in on you. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, they could have done, um, you know, it could have been the Simpsons could have been South Park yeah. season 39. Is of, South Park is any good now? No, uh, I mean, I'm partial to it. I, think I mean, I've always loved it. I just haven't watched any new episodes in like seven years. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I can't speak necessarily yeah. for that. Because even the n- newer, uh, like there's newer episodes of South Park yeah. that that are 10 years old for I me. See. I know? see. Like my version of newer South Park is. The, uh, I, I, there's that quote, I, I don't know, like resurfaces on like Instagram or x twitter all the time that's like basically jerry seinfeld just talking about how he he had to micromanage every aspect of it like or it wouldn't have worked sure and i was like i i I relate to this or it's just allowing me to like give myself permission for the way that i (laughs) the way that i am well I, i mean yeah you can't apologize for wanting to see your vision through yeah if you're you know lucky enough to have a vision but I feel like it's so it's so prevalent in the music industry to be like, oh, you got it to hear? Well, we've stopped worrying about it. We got it now. Yeah. And that's always a trap. Oh, nobody knows better that yeah. The we know We know what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. We know what we're Let doing. Let us pick the next single. We know. We know. We've got our best minds on it. <laughs> and it's guaranteed. Our ins- yeah. Our instincts have never never not not ever not not worked before does does this happen in the um in the i know you wear many hats but does this happen in the in the studio musician world or is it all pretty much no the whole industry of your no the whole industry is every version of sort of posturing of like I have like I alone can fix this. It's, yes, it's like dictator, but, but energy. <laughs> but it seems like the answer is always let's let's insert some middle management. <laughs> let's ha- just let's just create some friction between you and the result. Yeah, and profit. Yeah, the profits and <laughs> I have been told by an artist I was working with that uh, that I needed a manager because things were like, because there were complicated things that needed to be talked about, but and he didn't see it fit that, that you him would... and I were the ones to discuss it. And yes. let's talk to Mr. Manager. Yeah. Let's have our people talk about it and yeah. they'll work it out. Cause that's what they're for. And I'm like, I, I don't have a manager. Why don't you just talk to me? Why don't you just tell me what's, <laughs> what, what's up? Dude. You, have you have you ever had a a manager? Is that I, even a thing? Like in I think it is a thing in producer circles. Uh-huh. I don't think it's so much for session musicians. 
Gotcha. Um, I know people that like have somebody that run their calendar. Yeah. Um, sure. But no, I think the manager thing is that's more an artist. And like in California, in NLA, for example, in a world where the, you know, in a writing room, a producer has more of a attachment to the song and there's more like, the producer's role is slightly different yeah. than it is here. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a world in Nashville where most of the things are kind of, I want to say, it's sort of pre-negotiated. The, the big picture stuff in a Nashville writing room is yeah. fairly... The splits. The uh, splits. And if there's anything that is outside of that, uh, like I don't think it behooves anyone to have someone... Like, I wouldn't ever want to have someone talking on my behalf going like, well, man, we listened to the things here and I know you didn't give Dave production credit, but like, you know, yeah. we listen and there's, there's a, we, like, we officially want to make a stink about this. Yes. <laughs> and yes. on, on Dave's behalf and Dave's going, no, yeah, <laughs> just, it's all good. <laughs> like, chill. <laughs> like, we're good. Yeah. Um, well, I always, I always start this thing off with, with the same question. Which is how long have you been in town? I've been here since oh seven. Okay. Did, so where from? I moved here from Toronto. Okay. Canada. Yep. Uh, and I grew up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I've I've been talking about Calgary a lot for some reason. I it just people keep telling me it's very beautiful. It is. Uh, I mean, you've got it's very Denver esque, where it's okay. like to the immediate west. The western skyline is mountains. Okay. And the eastern... It's plains. It's all plains as you, far as you can see. Is there like a lot of... Canola. Cattle? Uh, yeah, there's ranching. Okay. Definitely. Someone told me it was the Fort Worth of Canada. Sure. Which I don't know if you've ever been to Fort Worth. But, I absolutely have. Um, there's no mountains in Fort Worth, so I'm not sure. You no, know, but the cattle thing, that's... Yeah. That rings like true. Western. It's very, yeah, Western themed. So did you have a, a love of country music or... No, from from that or just I didn't grow up with country music in my house. Okay, um, but my high school girlfriend sort of was into country music, and gotcha. so that was my first taste. Yeah, uh, into it, and I was like, "Oh, this is cool!" Was... And there was B three uh, prevalent in the music, which was the instrument that I was very passionate about very early on. Gotcha. So when I heard a band playing, that turned me on. And then when I heard the audible, like I, I could hear a B3 playing, I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. This is a genre of music. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it, this was 2001, 2002. Yeah. And uh, the musical landscape was not organic, if you would. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so did you go to Toronto? Was it for like music school or something? Or Yeah, like okay. that was my, uh, I didn't have good grades leaving high school. And when the opportunity was sort of presented that like there was a post-secondary possibility where I didn't have to rely on my grades, I could just like play the piano to get in. And I was like, oh. fuck yeah, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfect sense. That's for me. Yeah. Uh, That's so amazing. it was the easy way out. Yeah. That's the kind of how I ended up in music college myself. Right. So I was like, oh, here's a loophole. I don't, like I never took the, um, I never took the SAT. I don't know if you have that in Canada, but. No, no, no. But like pe people took SATs for American schools. That makes sense. If you had like money, money. Yeah, yeah. Like I would have loved to go to Berkeley. <laughs> that was like, <laughs> and I probably would be better off in life. I don't know. I don't I know. Think. I don't know if I learned anything there. You went to Berkeley. I did. Yeah. That was uh, prohibitive for a Canadian boy. Gotcha. Like it was there extra because it was also like the, out of out of state, out of country tuition. I would say, uh, yeah, like the uh, there were, we had to talk about the uh, exchange rate and stuff like that, I see. which just made th something difficult yeah. virtually impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes <laughs> that sense. That was the icing on the cake. But yeah, maybe I would be cooler and more equipped. I think you're, I think you're doing all right. I mean, I ended up dropping out of school. Okay. I didn't finish. So did you, did Nashville call or like how did, how did that work? Mm, 
the road called mm. and it was like why am i in school why do i need to do this everybody in school um is either planning on like the the faculty which were incredible musicians were at the end of the day faculty members yeah. at the school and they were also gigging at night yeah and i just when you actually start putting two and two together and go like i don't know if that is the career trajectory for me and then you start asking your peers and they're like yeah i want to i would love to teach college right and i go oh, well, yeah that, that's and that's great but not what you wanted that was not in that was not uh for me yeah i don't think so what did what was the what was the first road gig or were I, there many no, there was one first road gig that like allowed me to go, mom and dad, I am dropping out of school Yeah, um, and it's for the best. Um, and I, yeah, it's like I'd sent out a, this was in the days of MySpace. Yep. And I sent a MySpace message to six or seven of the Canadian country artists that I thought, because again, country music at that time was starting to, this is... 2005 2006 yeah and like i don't know there was more country in my purview and then um again with the real musicians playing sort of songs and right. my dream of just being a b3 player yeah um th that made the most sense and so um i had sent about uh yeah eight or nine messages to eight or nine different artists little did I know they were all managed by the same person and there was <laughs> one human receiving all of those messages. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, didn't hold it against me and introduced me to one of the artists and it worked out and it was a guy named Johnny Reed. Okay. Who is uh, still to this day a really big artist in Canada. Gotcha. And gets to live sort of the best of all of the worlds where he like steps off a plane in Toronto and he's like on a billboard there selling Tim Hortons coffee and like yeah. he's playing the whatever huge Enormo Dome sold out multiple nights and wow. and then gets off the plane here and goes and like lives in Brentwood and just has a normal life has like a totally chill life Dang. but like all of the success financially of being like a huge artist yeah that's amazing yeah he was kind of beat the game was that um was was the was the guy based in canada at the time or like did you did he, that move you to nashville or he was based here okay uh so he had been like he'd moved to nashville maybe five years before five or six years before i met him gotcha and sort of was trying to get a thing going here but as well up there yeah um and that just took off up there. Gotcha. And yeah, so how, I guess you got on, you went on the road and yeah. then how did that like end up with you? Well, you know? it was like, I realized there's a ceiling in Canada mm -hmm. um, for players where, you know, the, I was, I was playing with Johnny Reed, who was like one of the bigger country music artists. I was playing with another a pop singer named Amanda Marshall, who's another big Canadian name, sells out stuff. And then like down here, like no idea. Uh, but she was big in all of the like soccer playing nations in the world. So like gotcha. Europe, yeah. huge. She had hits there, just not the United States. Gotcha. Canada, yes. Um, and so I was playing with her and Johnny and... I still had to teach piano to sort of make ends meet and play gigs. And it seemed that the bigger the artist grew in Canada, the less gigs it turned into because uh. there are only so many major markets in Canada. And so once you s stop playing all of the little in between towns um, and play two nights at the whatever arena yeah. in Calgary, and then you go to Edmonton and then you go to wherever then you stop playing Lethbridge Alberta and Red Deer Alberta and Carstairs Alberta and like all of these other things and so a cross Canada tour was like 40 dates gotcha and so 
as things were getting bigger and like bigger in stature for him, the actual like number of gigs that we were playing went down and down. And yeah. So I was like, okay, well, I need to move to the States because um, there's, you know, a bigger population. Yeah. Ten times the population. Um, yeah. And and so Nashville, New York, L.A. were kind of the low-hanging fruit places that was like, okay, I'm going to go do one of these things. Johnny, the guy I worked with, lived in Nashville and... So that was also the closest drive from Toronto and it all yeah made sense and it was easy. Yeah. So that was what I chose. Wow. And did you did you like have anything lined up or was it just like a No, leap nothing of faith? lined up. It was a <laughs> totally idiotic leap of faith. I threw some stuff in a car with like really no plans. I told everybody I knew that I was moving to Nashville. <laughs> yeah. Cuz I was really like it was almost like t in order to manifest it, I had to just burn the boats. Yeah. So I was just like, this is what we're doing. Yeah. And I didn't realize like there's a border, <laughs> there's like immigration, there's like you come to the States and they're like, okay, uh, what's the last four of your social? I'm like, I, <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't have that. <laughs> They're like, okay, cool. Well, um, to give you a cell phone, uh, we're going to need a $900 deposit because <laughs> uh, you have no credit history and no existence on paper. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, this is kind of an issue, but all right. And then like tried to find a place to live. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I don't kind of need a social for that. And the places that were available to live, if you didn't have a social word, not places you wanted to live. Not awesome, which yeah. I spent a little bit of time in, and that was, yeah, interesting. Yeah. No so, doubt. uh, yeah. So I went back to Canada <laughs> to figure some shit out, um, and then a little less than maybe fourteen months later, I came down here again with a with the documentation <laughs> that you needed. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Like, okay, well, here's a work visa, at least. Yeah. So that I can, like, live. I was like, I'll just play cash gigs. And yeah. That, and that was like, and no one, I don't know. It's like, I can't blame anyone else for, like, being like, is that a, is that a good idea? Yeah. <laughs> like, it was not a good well, idea. Well, you just had the. But I had to learn. Yeah. You had the the naive, na naiveness of youth, you know. Totally. Where it's like, yeah, this will work out. This is going to be great. And you know what? It did work out. So, I mean, in a way. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Um, what did that... So you moved down here second time, I guess. Yes. Kind of have some things, a few more things figured out. Just anyway. like a couple of things, yeah. but not... I'm not familiar too much with your, you know, early Nashville history. So how does, how do you go from, you know, starting at at zero to being you know an in-demand studio musician like what was that first like I how mean, long did that take you a bunch of years yeah like uh definitely i mean i toured at least for five or six years after that gotcha um, in it with with so i so i started to play lower broadway and i started this is like obviously in 07 yeah. 08 so it's like not lower Broadway like it is today, but it's just a sort of less intense version of, gotcha. of that where you could like park in front of the bar <laughs> and like, yeah, I wheeled my Leslie speakers and like keyboards and stuff. Like I was the idiot that was like dragging huge amounts of gear to lower Broadway. But you need it. I needed it to keep a good attitude yeah. <laughs> about what I was doing. <laughs> uh, and... I was like, and I always thought that I needed some kind of shtick. Like, so the Leslie was the, the Leslie was the shtick. Like that's great <laughs> shtick. Like, and no one doesn't like it. No one's, no yeah. one's like, it's you idiot. You're, that you're dragging organ a... sounds so awesome. <laughs> yeah. They're like, you're crazy, but okay. Yeah. You're just dragging a speaker cab, like the size of your body yeah. down Broadway. <laughs> yeah. hundred uh, percent. And I'm quite adept at maneuvering it uh, in and out of car and I can go up and down flights of stairs with it. By myself i don't need anyone help but amazing um yeah i started to do that 
I played b- bars and started to sort of get hooked in to things. Because uh, what I've noticed from the start is that there is seems to be a lack of keyboard players compared to other instruments. Sure. I always think that I'd have a would have had a much harder time over the decades. Yeah. Had I just play bit, guitar, been a guitar player and trying to do it. So I feel like lucky that I just was picked the right instrument. Yeah. But yeah, I got an audition for a Joe Nichols gig. Awesome. And I took the audition and they dug it. There you go. And that was... That was it. Then I was on the road with a U.S. artist, and that was what I... That was the goal. What was popping for Joe Nichols at the time? Was this before Sunny in 75? This is before Sunny in 75. This is... um, um, Give Me That Girl. Yeah. Um, And he was just getting like career version 2.5 gotcha. off the ground. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I got that road gig and it was like a great band and I was still in that, like, get me on a bus. I don't care where it's going. I don't care what we're playing. Yeah. I just wanted to be on a bus. Yeah. And then... At some point, you're like, get me off this bus. <laughs> yeah. How, how long were you on that gig for? Uh, about four years. Okay. Almost five years. Gotcha. And is this kind of when you started transitioning into doing more studio stuff? Yeah. Th- that was like where it became obvious that it was maybe time to think of what's next. Because it was always, like, I was always conscious about, like, when I started, like, like I was always conscious of the people that I wanted to be like when I grew up and the people I didn't want to be like when I grew up. Yeah. And the people that I wanted to be like, uh, weren't like jaded and fucking angry about life and stuff. And so I've been always good about removing myself from situations that don't like that. I'm not able to be my best self. Yeah. And like when the, and you're on a gig and the road manager is like, you guys are playing Letterman next week. That's awesome. And like my response was just like, fuck. <laughs> like I would way rather sit on this bus. Like fuck LaGuardia, fuck a 4 a.m. lobby call, like Letterman, <laughs> the studio. It's like 55 degrees. That guy kept the studio like super cold. Like that's where my head was. And it's yeah. like. You don't want to be there. It's maybe time for you to examine whether that's the place for you to be because yeah. I was also like emailing I still like and I laugh today about it with him like emailing the band leader about they had like paid unpaid travel day uh, rules about certain things and I was starting to be the squeaky wheel going like hey you know like I, I counted unpaid travel days last year to whatever. And there was like 15 and now, oh, okay. now it's March and we're just, I'm not saying anything, but we're like already up to six. And I just, yeah, I just want to bring that to your attention. I don't know if that, you know, and it's like th- all of those things. It's like, okay, I'm not going to change these people's business practices. Like, right. This is, it's just time to see what else is out there. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. So then I was like, okay, it's time. It's time. So how does one break into the studio musician man uh Nashville scene? Like I mean, it's always some sort of fluke, basically, but I mean it takes some sort of champion waving your flag. Um yeah. for me it was songwriters that like it wasn't going to be another musician going, I'm going to put my reputation on the line. The studio stuff is like, there's higher stakes than a live gig. Yeah. You know, like the band leader on any session, it's not him who's paying the bills. It's the artist, the label, the whatever the band leader for the most part, um, at least then 
was the one that hired the band. And man, it's just tough to expect somebody like that to like take a chance on a new keyboard player, let's say. Yeah. Like I, if he can't look the artist in the face and go, this guy's awesome. He's going to crush it. Don't even worry about it. Yeah. Um, then like, then what? And so the answer was really through the songwriters. Uh, and so a uh, friend of mine, Stephen Lee Olson. Yeah. Uh, so who, yeah. Like man. A, another great Canadian. Yes. Uh, hit songwriter, Stephen Lee Olson was a friend of mine. We moved to town very, very similar times. Gotcha. So he was getting started and writing and publishing and I was trying to just be a keyboard player. And so he, um, he kind of vouched for me and it was his session. It was his, uh, Ilya demo session at benchmark yeah. in 2012, 13 ish. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he said, I'd love for my friend Dave to be keys and, you know, and Ilya goes like, Oh, like, all right, it's your gig, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> in his best. <laughs> yes. It's very uh, Ilya. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and that was the day I met, I don't exactly remember who like the band was, but it was Chris Utley and probably Derek Wells and yeah. Miles and could have been, you know, whoever on the, it could have been Dela, could have been, yeah. um, someone, but that was the sort of first time. And then as with any gig in town, this was the same with lower Broadway. This was the same with anything where it's kind of like you start being, you know, you start and you get on someone's radar and you're the 15th on their list Yep, and you're happy to be there. And like, cool, well, call me next time 14 other people can't do it and I'll be happy to do it. Yeah. And so then maybe the second time you get called, you're 10th on the list. And then six months later, you're eight on the list and yeah. whatever it was until I, I was higher up the list and I was working kind of regularly. Was there um, like a specific session or day or moment where you were like, I did it? Or was it like more of a, um, you know, frog in the boiling water situation? I feel like there was a moment one day when I was driving home going, I think I'm doing it. Yeah. Like, I think I'm doing it, but I'm also this like, don't look at it. Well, you're sc you're so scared it's I all going to go away. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But do you remember what it was? Like what the, was I it a particular session or? I don't think it was any one particular session. Just a um, moment. There was a moment where, and maybe it was, I had X number of sessions that week. I mean, the goal up until very recently in my life is just like, how busy can you be? Yeah. Like the goal is to be as busy as you can be. There's three sessions on a union basis yeah. per day and you can work six to seven days a week. And if I can fill that up, then I'm doing the best. Yeah. And so that's what I set out for. And so I guess maybe it was a Friday and I looked back at my schedule and I was like, I did at least one session every day this week. Like, damn, this might be sustainable. Yeah. <laughs> and I may get to, uh, you know, and I never said no to work. I always just said I'm not available. Um, right. And so I may say, be able to start saying that I'm not available for, you know, this type of work that was on the way out. Yeah, like, yeah. At that time it was like showcases and stuff like that. Yeah, you're... Some like live in town stuff. It's it's always like an interesting inflection point because um, you're so hungry for work. So then you're like at the buffet table and at, at, at a certain point your plate is completely full, but you're just, you've spent the last 10 years like in a begging starving. for food. <laughs> totally. So it's really hard once the plate does get completely full to go, oh, I guess I have to say no to this. And like you have no muscle 
Right. For saying no. Right. So you you just, can't fit this steak on your plate yeah. because of all of these noodles. But it's like, but I want it. I like noodles, but like, <laughs> God, that steak looks really good. Yeah. But it's it's hard. It's hard to start to say no to things. It is incredibly hard. Um, even now I like find myself in ridiculous. I'm like, why, why, why am I doing this right now? I should, should have, you know, yeah. thought better, but I just always try and remember. Well, that's the, it's like you're trying and it's not... Like I am better than this no, thing. It's not. it's the am I able to be my best self on that thing? And enough times of saying yes to something where you go, like I've been I've said a yes to a certain type of either live gig or road gig where it's oh it's just a weekend, oh it's just it'll be easy, it's just a month, it's just a this. Yeah. And like being up there on stage going like I would pay these people twice what they're paying me to just let me leave. <laughs> to not like, be here. Right I just now. like I and no harm, no foul. Here you go, dude. Here's here's yeah. a couple hundred bucks. I'm out. You yeah. can even use my gear. Whatever you <laughs> want. Like I just want to leave, please. Yeah. Um, and so there's a like and so I forget who it was that told me this, but it's like how many times do you find yourself in a situation where you are regretting saying no to something hmm. and the answer is like not that many yeah like obviously there's like man that guy paul mccartney like I, he asked me to go on tour but i didn't know who he was and i didn't look him up until it was too late and then i looked him up and it, it yeah. would have been a cool tour but like yeah that, not that but like so rarely if ever i don't think i've ever said no to something that i wasn't sure i wanted to do and then been like man, I really missed out on something awesome. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, as opposed sense. to being on a gig going, ah, oh, get me off. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, this sucks. Totally. So you only learn those lessons so many times. Well, you just got to learn it the hard way. Sure. You know, you got to go through it. Right. Did it, um, I don't know, is it, it, do you feel like it's the same now if somebody's like moving to town with their, their keyboard and their giant Leslie it's always speaker the hardest cab? Thing. I know. I know it's hard to to say specifically, but there's somebody, you know, sitting there with their guitar or whatever going like, I want to be a studio musician in Nashville. Totally. It's like, how do you do it? It's like, start walking. At- yeah. Like, I don't think that there is a, a, a single good answer to that. Yeah. Like, and even less so than there was before. Like, if this was 2007, I'd say, go play on Lower Broadway, learn the thing meet some people, Lower Broadway is not going to get you into the studio, but it's going to get you reps. Yeah. It's going to, like, you will understand the, the like, the context for everything. You're going to le- learn songs that you wouldn't have known and why they're, why they work, why they don't work. Yeah. You'll learn a hundred songs you didn't know. Um, and then I'd say go down to... The Fiddle and Steel, which isn't a bar anymore. And on Tuesday nights, the like pro jam happens. That's, yeah. you know, like, and it was like Toby Keith's band. That was the band there. And like, you yeah, maybe you get to sit in if you think. And then when yeah. you sit in, you know, play all the good notes. So like <laughs> they want you to do it again. Yeah. Um, I don't know what today's version of that is. Uh, like it's, it's not whiskey jam. Like as far as the player is concerned, like, yeah, like the answer is to go and be seen and go hang and make friends. Well, it's like the same in anything. It's like start at the bottom, work your way to the top. Totally. That's the, you know, that's, that's pretty much any career field, how you have to do it. Right. And yeah, I don't know how you do it. Um, right now in 2024, which feels like there's no way it's 2024, but it is. Yeah. And there's no right or wrong way necessarily to yeah to get in. I don't know. Like I I I recognize that I have a slightly sort of myopic view of the way things work. Just yeah. Like just because of where I am and what I do. Sure. Like on the ground, <laughs> like on the ground when I meet someone for breakfast and they're picking my brain at Fenwick's on a any sort of given morning. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I don't have great advice other than just relax 
and like be a good guy. Enjoy the ride. Yeah. Like you can't push a rope. You can't make the thing happen. Like yeah. you can't, uh, but you can like be a good guy and you can not have desperation on your Yeah, they can breath. smell it. You could be, you for sure smell, smell it. it. So it's like any timeline that you have in your head of like whatever you think you should be doing by whatever time you think you should be doing that. It's yeah. like double it. Yeah. Just triple it. Just <laughs> it's go. moot. And it's a 30 year town. Great. 30 year <laughs> town. You're going to be so great. It's like a mortgage. Like you could work really hard and pay it off early. Yeah. But relax. Yeah. It's here. 30 years. You're fixed rate. Well, um, man, you've done so much incredibly interesting stuff. I guess at some point you sort of, moved into like a, or, or I'm sure you were always doing it, but started to have some big kind of co-producing and producing credits. Like, was that um, work with like, cause I think you've done, you did some stuff on Dangerous, mm -hmm. Hardy. Um, I know there's a ton more than that, but yeah. like, how did that, that, you know, how did that kind of come into, into yeah. view? I mean, that all, that started when I had a similar, like, on the bus, I was like, maybe I need to remove myself or like figure out what's going on. I like just like sessions at the very, very beginning of me playing sessions, checking around with my surroundings. It was obvious the people like the grownups that I wanted to be like yeah. and the people I didn't want to be like. And gotcha. there is a certain thing with a seasoned session player on a session where they're the big shit in the room and they play a pass of something and then they go sit in the lounge and then someone goes, Hey, would you, would you just do like me? We're just kind of maybe hearing a pad, maybe just something else. Cause you just played one thing. And yeah. he's like, you know, and like, I didn't really think it needed it, but like, all right, fine. <laughs> like that just checked out just on your phone, just that thing where you just uh, a little complacent and a little whatever. Yeah. Um, I don't feel like I ever fully got there because I'm aware of and fearful of getting there, but I noticed myself not being my best self on a lot of types of sessions. Gotcha. Usually it was the sessions that didn't, like we were making music. We, it's the sessions that you're sort of trading just time for money, mm -hmm. knowing that there's not going to be a life for the stuff you're working on gotcha. when you f f when you f um make 100 percent of your living from just playing an instrument you often don't like really get to say yes to uh say no to that you just kind of say yes to everything basically yeah, yeah yeah and in nashville like could be 50 50 uh at the best of times of it's not all Morgan Wallen records. It's not all like awesome Dan Huff productions. Like there's a lot of just lame stuff where you're hired for the day to this girl from a small town and her dad's paying the thing. And yeah, the songs are like, you know, enough to know that like just the song, just the, the, just the the songs make this a non-starter. Like right. there is no chance that this will ever be big. No matter how well she sings, no matter how popular she is in town, no matter how diluted, it's kind of like the only two people in that studio session. You can have Grammy winning engineer at Blackbird D with the band of destiny, like <laughs> the, the greatest band of all time. And that happens every day in Nashville. Yeah. And the only two people that don't know what's going on, like, are the artist and the artist's dad. Yeah. <laughs> who are paying for the thing. And that's a part of the economy here. Um, yeah. But it's on those days that I found myself not being my best. Gotcha. And so I started just, I was working on a lot of records with Joey Moy at the time. Yeah. Um, and... I just started asking him, like, what what should I do next? I don't know. Like, this is good. Like, I fear that I'm peaking too early. Like, 
I, I won some of those awards and yeah. like it's all going really well. That brought up some existential dread of, do I just do this forever and yeah. then die? Like, do we do this for six? You were like the more? you were like the dog that caught the car or something. Sure. Yeah. Like that. W- I mean, I should be so lucky to of do this of for forty more years. Um, but I also was like, oh, fuck, do I really have to do this for forty more? Years? Like, yeah. is this it? Yeah. So there's something more. Right. There. Ha- I mean, there has to be something more. Um, and so. I was having those kind of just conversations with Joey and, um, you know, I was like, do I have to go down to lower Broadway and find myself a young cowboy that's <laughs> promising that has I a good produce. voice that I could produce yeah. and, you know, and it's like, he's like, well, yeah, I mean, you could do that, you know, or you could like edit these drums. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so it just started with this, like, I don't want to call it apprenticeship or whatever, but yeah, um, he systematically kind of worked with me and brought me up to speed on how uh, the steps that he takes to make a record. Yeah. And w- what is it like working with someone like Joey Moy? Is it like, I mean, because he's done like pretty I- much all the biggest records of the last 20 years like he's a part of a lot of right and i go as far as like the person if i could go to producer school for a a period of time like he's clearly the type of guy that's had cross genre success cross eras like over the decades over genres over whatever it's like he's figured something out yeah um and so I just, my questions were all like, and the internal questions sure. that were later answered, but just like, what do you do? Like, how do you do this? What do you do every record? What do you do differently every record? Mm. How do you make it all not sound the same, but also cohesive? And like, just all of the things that he does seemingly effortlessly. Yeah, intuitively on some level. For yeah, him. like he, his instincts are dialed yeah Uh, he knows for him in his world what is up and what's down and what's black and what's white and it's not um like he he has a lot of that figured out yeah um and so for me it was a lot of it was just sort of like watching it's it was like just data gathering yeah like I watched however many hundreds of songs go from a work tape, a demo, a piano vocal, or whatever, to a finished song. Yeah. So for me, it was like just data gathering. Yeah. And like You're reps. Watched some watching a master cook, man. Totally. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So I'm like eternally grateful for that opportunity. Yeah. And uh got to sort of see how his version of sausages yeah is made, is made <laughs> which is that's uh, amazing which is super amazing yeah well you've you've done a lot of pretty amazing stuff won some big awards so like at this point like what what makes you excited like what do you what do you want to do next i want to um keep uh, like I want to figure out the like the perfect balance of session playing, production, songwriting, and there's a new season of artist development that I'm sort of venturing into. Yeah. Um, and uh, just kind of seeing where this new. It's like I spent the last. I'm just finishing my like baby's first publishing deal uh i'm in the fourth year of that so i spent the last three years with a really heavy writing side of it and almost stopped producing the last like three years yeah um recently just sort of started to to turn the volume back up on that yeah um but i just wanted reps on the songwriting thing and just 
figure that out. Was it hard? Were you having to say no to certain sessions and certain production work to write songs? Yeah. 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 But that's hard to do. Uh, totally hard to do. Um, but also a great exercise in realizing that like, it's okay. Everything, like nothing's fucked. Like yeah. on, on any given, like your fight or flight, like you are fighting your fight or flight lizard brain yeah. on like just, and it uh, saying yes or no. So you, someone asks you to do a demo session that you know, it's going to be a long, hard day. Like it's like, hey, can we start at 9 a.m.? Can we do, can we work through dinner? Can we do an hour of overtime after we're going to try and get, you know, 19 songs that day? Yeah. And I'm just like, it's not for me. My, uh, well, yeah, but I mean, instincts say, my instincts say like, yeah, that's a whole day of work. Like do it. You're going to get paid. <laughs> yeah. And I go, well, I could probably do more with that time doing something else, investing in the future. It's like, there's the, it's the upfront money versus the investing in something and building an asset. Yeah. Planting seeds. That's And stuff. the hardest part about planting seeds is sometimes it don't rain for a while. So oh. you're going, oh my God, it's been 18 months of me <laughs> right. throwing these seeds everywhere. And I'm like, what do right. I have to show for this? Right. And then one day you turn around and, you know, beautiful garden or, or whatever. Sure. It's hard. It's, I mean, it, it is, it's harder. It, it's way harder in practice to even do it than even like, I mean, talking about it is, yeah. it's hard to talk about and it's harder to actually like, well, put I, into practice. I'm inspired by you and your story because it's, you know, I think you have or had uh, every opportunity to just sort of be complacent and, you know, keep doing what you were doing and were very successful at and still do. But that you just were stay. I don't know. You you seem like you stay curious and stay yep. inspired, and that's probably the key to you I know think if longevity. I, was a, I I think that's the answer. It's kind of like the. It's not one or the other. It's an and, not an or world. I like to think about like yeah. these days, especially like the advice for the keyboard players in the world and the guitar players. It's like. Yeah, like be all, as many things to as many people as you can. And the days of, it used to be so, like Nashville used to be so segmented, especially in the musician world where road musicians didn't play on records mm -hmm. or in the studio. And studio musicians, like master scale musicians didn't play on demos and demo people never got the call for you know, like that's a demo, that's more of a demo player. Like I you want a rec, you want a guy that plays on records. Yeah. Like, and though, and now these days, you know, there's, t I can name 20 musicians that have a full-time touring gig and a thriving session career and do it all and have some sort of side hustle here. And, and I don't know, there's people out there that know me as a accordion player. Yeah. Like, and uh, introduce me to someone else. This is Dave. He plays great accordion. And I'm like, yeah, I thank you. Amazing. Like, I, I'm happy to be that for you. Yeah. Uh, I love that. <laughs> but, yeah. I think when I was driving over here, the thing that I thought about the most was that you were living a dream that I have. It's, it's, a, it's a two dream. And I don't want to put you on the spot. No. But Hear me out. You've got an awesome Porsche. Oh, I hear you out. Yeah. And you got a studio house. Yeah. You got a house. That's yeah. just it's just studio stuff. Yeah. That, and that that's 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 my dream. You are living my dream. I want you to know that. Thank you for saying that because <laughs> I have been trying to like the feeling of feel like how do you, how to feel successful? Yeah. And to feel like you're doing it is way harder than doing that because I don't know. It's like, uh, I mean, thank you for saying that. Yeah. The, like the house, I. Necessity just, of some level, I'm sure. Well, I mean, I just, I bought a house in East Nashville in 2010 yeah. and I, you know, I paid 170 for the house and 
I was like, my budget is 150. Like <laughs> I'm never going to financially recover from this. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's actually the cheapest scenario for me to be writing. And yeah. Yeah. Um, it's an in- inspiring place. Totally. Yeah. Um, and the, yes, the Porsche was a vasectomy gift to myself because I <laughs> made it to 36 years old without having children. And I'm like, I know so many people with children and I know this car costs less money. That car is cheaper than a kid. Way sure. cheaper than a kid. <laughs> and so, I don't know. It's the only thing I've ever really wanted was a Porsche. Oh my God. Like from five years old. Yeah, so that's amazing. Being the like... Uh, you know, like, I don't know. There, there, I had to get over a lot to allow myself to do that. Yeah. And to, I don't know, like to, to own it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to, I, I certainly do not ever feel like I have, I'm having any success. I'm like afraid to even admit it because if I do, I'm like, well, then I'm going to let my foot off the gas. Right. And it's like, you work too hard to get here. So every, you know, I'm, I'm having an existential crisis pretty much 24 hours a day. Right. But I'm trying to stop. You're not alone. <laughs> but the truth is that, you know, if we're know, any, there's uh, so many metaphors. Yeah. But like, for me, it's like the, okay, where if the metaphor today or in this moment is an airplane flying and you're using full thrusters to get the thing off the ground thing off the ground if you stay at full throttle once you reach cruising altitude you're not going to make your final destination you're not gonna Mm. you're gonna run out of gas yeah before you get there and you don't the the truth is and this is what i have learned oh and it's taking me so many years of basically saying no to some things yeah that like the plane stays in the air at half throttle. And that is not a pilot that is like bitching out. Yeah. <laughs> like you don't look at that pilot that is using a normal amount of throttle to keep his airplane in the air and go like that guy, guy could be working harder. You know, like the guy's that just, guy's not on his grind. No, that guy's not <laughs> grinding. Like he's guy's kind of fucking lazy. Yeah. Like, Man, uh, that's, that's that and is so such a great metaphor. If you can take the, if you can take the judgment out of that. And that's something that I'm working in this season of life is going back from that. Like the goal at some point was to, be as busy as possible and i i i did that i did as many sessions as i could for as long as i could and yeah it was years and years and i'm grateful for it but then it's kind of like the you know you the what a a clenched hand you can catch more with an open yeah whatever all the other metaphors yeah and stuff like that but i mean that's the truth of it is that's that amazing it's so it's so uh it's so clear like nothing terrible is gonna happen yeah it's gonna be all right it's really Just gonna be breathe, okay yeah you know hang out in the studio house and meditate make music i started meditating dude it's big is it working yeah definitely like as far as a practice a way to um actually do it's like something that's actionable to Mm. um, work to combat the internal dialogue in your brain that yeah that's constantly going and that's human condition every single person has thoughts that pop into their head yeah Uh, and so the 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 (laughs) the ease at which you recognize those thoughts as thoughts as opposed to immediately identifying with them and going down deep rabbit holes. Yeah. Uh, and then like living your life based on those rabbit holes and living in rabbit holes and all that stuff. The act of this whole like meditation thing actually, it's like going to the gym and the muscle is, your working is the one that stops your brain from going crazy. Yeah. 
and That's, just that makes a lot of sense working on overtime yeah yeah i have no breaks yeah up here it's good and that works but yeah. it also sometimes it's a little prison sometimes <laughs> it's a, and and it's like there, and there's no judgment but sometimes just recognizing the thought for what it is yeah that it's a thought yeah that's beautiful is very is really valuable it's good advice um well hey thank you so much for being here dude i appreciate it and um that's it that's the pod see you later thank you so much for listening to this episode of 10 year town if you're still listening you must have liked it so we hope that you will leave us a rating or review on apple or spotify or give us a subscription on uh, youtube it's all free don't cost you nothing but uh, we appreciate you being here and uh, thank you for supporting the 10-year town community see you next week